Welcome back to the channel everybody, my name is Trey. Uh, a lot of you guys have been asking me for stocks I've been following or joining a Discord group or something like that where we can stay in closer communication. So I've decided to start a little series, three stocks I'm looking at for this month. Uh, a lot of big finance, a lot of big investing YouTubers do a similar kind of thing. Um, I think this combination of three stocks I haven't seen it yet. All three of them have been very exciting for me to watch, especially in the last few weeks. Um, but all three of them also have very good long-term prospects as well. Now this series isn't necessarily meant to be something for you to like copy and paste or just mimic. It's more mainly to be kind of like idea generation or a way for you to maybe hear about a new stock you've never heard about. Um, one of these stocks I've only mentioned once for a second on my whole channel so far. And a couple of them I haven't done full in-depth videos for you guys yet on either. So those will be coming. Hope you guys enjoy it. First one, many of you guys who've been watching me for the last few months know that I love this company called Skills. It's the world's first publicly traded esports gaming platform and it's mobile based. We've seen the stock price rise from about 24 bucks in January up to where it sits now at 41 bucks currently only over a few weeks. You guys know that I'm typically looking at stocks for the mid to long term, like at least a half year, if not three or five years. Um, skills fulfills all of my requirements for that, but we've already seen the stock go up by like double in a few weeks. So it's been pretty exciting on that grounds. Um, I'm pretty confident we'll be able to keep going forward, going up to the right, in the right direction uh, for the coming months and years as well. With big investors like ARK Invest, Kathy Wood, uh, we've seen the stock price growing and the market cap now sits at about 15 billion. So it's still a relatively small company. Uh, if you're a fan of DraftKings, the company who set up their SPAC is also responsible for the SPAC, special purpose acquisition company that set up um, Skills too. They IPO'd back in April of 2020. Skills is an esports gaming platform that brings more casual skill-based games to a broader user base than is been typical of esports. Check it out here, they show their demographics, largely female actually, majority female, with a very interesting spread of ages over on the right side there, going all the way up to 66 plus. A large number of their gamers are probably already retired. And you can also see on the left side, their income spread, most of them under 75,000 um, going all the way up. And it's really interesting, I've done a longer, more in-depth video where I played some of the games and I examined how the system is monetized and stuff like that, but it's just really, really easy to start playing games for money. You know, like I'm really, really shysty when it comes to in-app purchases, but it was just really easy to just be like, yeah, I'll put in 20 bucks and maybe I'll earn a few bucks, you know, playing with people and stuff like that. That's kind of the whole business model. This illustration shows minutes per user per day. They've topped TikTok, Facebook, and YouTube handily with 62 minutes per user per day. And the games and the whole platform is just really addicting, really easy to just keep going on. Um, you don't have to sit around and wait for a match. You can play the match and then your scores are compared a few minutes or even many minutes later with the competitor. Skill solves the problem game developers have been having in recent years, where the market is growing, as you can see here, getting a lot more developers who've grown up playing games their whole lives, competing for a smaller piece of the pie. A small amount of games blow up, making huge amounts of money, but the thousands of unnoticed games end up making very, very little. So Skills combines the competitive aspect of gaming with their broad player base, and shares the income with the champions as well as the game developers, as they show here in their business model. They show you the entry fee for the two competitors coming in, and then the developer profit share, prizes and incentives is the majority of that income. Then they have their take rate times their gross margin, then they end up with their 25% margin down at the bottom. So you're gonna end up with the cycle of developers making more money, therefore wanting to make more games for the skills kind of network, and the more fun games there are, the more players are going to join it, putting in money, and the more players there are, the more people want to make games for this platform. And so you end up with this like really cool cycle of growth. And there have been other companies who've tried to pull off something like this so far, but nobody's done it as well as Skills has yet. Here's a quick P&L summary showing growing GMVs over the years, as well as an expected growing take rate, therefore leading to expected growing revenue and gross profit and contribution over the coming years. They're expecting to be very, very big um, within the next couple of years. I've been enjoying the gains so far, but I'm also expecting to 
see more and more gains going into the future. Stock number two is Desktop Metal. I'm working on a full, big, in-depth video for Desktop Metal when their earnings come out in a couple of days, and I'll be sharing that right up here. I've been holding Desktop Metal for a few months now, and we've, similar to Skills, we've seen the price go up really, really quickly, kind of shockingly quickly. Um, it was 10 bucks back in November, and now it sits at about 30 bucks, but it's gone as high as 34. Desktop Metal is a potentially like industry-breaking company that could pioneer and play a really big role in what's called the fourth industrial revolution. So over the years, we've seen industrial revolutions change the way the entire world operates. Desktop Metal could bring manufacturing back to the US. It's going to have really big impacts on outsource manufacturing and also speed, mass production, prototyping, all these different kinds of industries are going to be largely affected by desktop metal going into the future. A bunch of big players like ARK Invest, Google, GE have all backed, I think even Chamath Palihapitiya has all, have also backed um, desktop metal and we've seen it growing, but we can't really expect really big um, revenues for the coming kind of couple of years because these projects they're working on are very, very capital intensive and to stay at the leading bleeding edge of the market, they're going to be spending a lot of time developing and developing R&D, R&D, marketing, marketing, before they start outputting these basically um, little factories that you can have in your shop, in your parts department, or you know down the street at a little print shop kind of thing. I should also mention that Desktop Metal makes up about 4.3% of ARC's 3D printing fund. Those of you who are fans of ARC already know that ARC only invests in industries and companies that are going to disrupt and change the way the world works going forward. Um, I think this is ranked number four in their 3D printing fund. The applications are endless for Desktop Metal's products, but imagine, for example, dealerships. Dealerships currently have to carry thousands of different little parts for all of the different grades of all of their different makes and models over the numerous years. Um, and if they don't have the part, they have to call a distribution center, oftentimes on the other side of the country, wait for shipping and stuff like that. But now if they set up one of these desktop metal printing shops, basically in their parts uh, department, they can basically get the schematics from their manufacturer, print out the part, and then put it on your car. And desktop metal prints in metal. They also print in fiber. They've also recently announced in January the acquisition of a dental printing business, which has been growing really well and further strengthens their dominance and potential dominance on the market. Other applications include mass production. So if you're trying to print out like thousands or tens of thousands of little parts for you know machines or fridges or whatever type of equipment, rather than outsourcing it to China or Vietnam or something like that, your machine, your machine printing room can now print out thousands or tens of thousands of these. You avoid all of the shipping costs. You don't have to worry about um, how long it's gonna take. It's just like really, really quick done on the spot. Another big potential application is for prototyping. Now when you're prototyping, let's say you come up with a new invention. You're like, I wanna make this thing, it's gonna change the world. Now you have to figure out manufacturing on the other side of the world. Find a company that's willing to work with you in English or in whatever language you work in and that you can trust with this new invention. You guys are probably familiar with the fact that patent law doesn't really matter in China. <laughs> and so, that brings in one of the big threats, you know? And so I've actually had a bunch of ideas where I'm like, yeah, I wanna make that, but figuring out the whole process, outsourcing it to a place I can trust that I can have really good communication with and printing all these different versions seems like it's gonna be a big pain, so for, just forget it for now. But if you can print out all these different versions locally with a company that you trust or even in your own print shop, then it's a very different story. Additionally, another potential application is like I'm a car guy, I love cars, and I know that things are shifting to electric, but if you wanted to try printing out different uh, modifications for your car, even changing the engine or printing out new versions or alterations or altercations of engines or parts or pistons or things like that, you can do that. You know, you couldn't print out a working engine, but you could print out all the different parts and then assemble it into a new engine. And the potential applications for that are like insanely endless. So I'm excited about this stock in the short term and the long term, but be aware, like I mentioned earlier, they're not 
predicting like big solid revenues at least until like late 2022 or something like that. We'll see how the earnings come up uh, in the next couple of days, but there will be risk associated with this company because they don't have a lot moving quite yet. Before we get into number three, uh, I've been getting a lot of requests to set up a Patreon channel where we can be in more close contact with each other. People want to be following uh, my stock picks. People want to be in more close communication with me. Um, and some people just want to support what we're doing here. So I've actually set up something similar to Patreon called Buy Me A Coffee. It's much easier to send support as a supporter um, and you send in denominations of a cup of coffee. And because I've also been receiving a lot of requests for one-on-one uh, -on -one calls, coaching call type things, um, I've also set up a few different options. So if you'd like to chat with me for like 40 minutes for an extended call, uh, we can set that up too. So please click buy me a coffee link down below in the description if you'd like to learn more. So number three is Brookfield Renewables, BEP. So as everybody knows, a new president on the scene, there's going to be a lot of money flooding into renewables. Um, the world must change regardless of which country you live in, the world needs to be making moves to be taking advantage of renewable power. We're talking solar, wind, hydro, and others. Um, BEP is one of the world's biggest organizations. Check it out on their website. They say, Brookfield Renewable Partners operates one of the world's largest publicly traded renewable power platforms. Its portfolio consists of approximately 20,000 megawatts of capacity and over 5,300 generating facilities in North America, South America, Europe, and Asia. Its investment objective is to deliver long-term annualized total returns of 12 to 15 percent, including annual distribution increases of 5 to 9 percent from organic cash flow growth and project development. Uh, it goes on to explain more about what they do, but it also mentions we're an experienced global owner and operator of and investor in wind, solar, distributed generation, and storage facilities. So one of the really complex problems we have with power is that typical traditional power generation, let's say you're burning coal, you can't store that or you can't pause it easily. Nuclear power, you can't just put the brakes on it and stop it easily either. But they're also making moves into storing power. So if you're producing too much or people just aren't as using as much as you expected, you can store it and use it later, which is the magic of batteries. And BEP is also working on that front. Another big avenue of growth for them is that, especially in North America, but also in Europe and Asia increasingly, Countries, governments are fining companies for carbon production. So the more carbon, the more pollution you produce, the more you have to pay into these different taxes. And so um, companies can say, hey, we're getting owned up by these taxes. Hey, BEP, hey, Brookfield, help us. And so Brookfield will sell them energy that's created by renewable sources, and they'll be now powered by renewable sources without necessarily having to go build a solar farm in their backyard or something like that. And so because of these dynamics and increasingly large taxes and penalties going into the future 2030 and stuff like that, um, it's kind of foolish to not make the switch into renewables. And additionally, Biden is pushing for more growth in this field as well. So we're gonna start seeing stocks like BEP continue to take off. It's really interesting because we've seen a lot of stock growth. Check out the stock price chart here. This is the one year chart as opposed to uh, the more zoomed in ones on the last couple of stocks. Um, last year, early last year, we saw as low as like 20-ish bucks. We're up to near 50 now. And I've been riding the coattails the entire time, enjoying the growth. But the crazy thing is that you're getting growth like a young company, but you also have the stability and um, wise cash management of you know Brookfield as a whole. Plus, you also get what is right now a 2.5% dividend, um, which is pretty juicy too. Before I get into a quick look at their financials, they just came out with their 2020 full year results. I need to explain a term, funds from operations, FFO. Typically when we're looking at companies that aren't dealing primarily in real estate related stuff, we're looking at like revenues and earnings per share and things like that. But because real estate changes in value so much and there's things like amortization and appreciation are such a huge part of the equation, um, real estate focused companies use FFO. So you take earnings and then you add depreciation and amortization and then you subtract gains from the sales of land to get the FFO. So for the total of 2020, FFO was up 6% year over year to 807 million. They say that on a normalized basis, per unit results are up 23%. And the wind segment alone was up 51% year over year to 376 million. 
of FFO. I mentioned that they have a strong cash position as well. They're sitting at about $3.3 billion in liquidity. And so um, Brookfield is well known for, for growth, but also for being very conservative. Um, when it comes to these types of projects, when you're buying like huge solar farms or like hydroelectric dams or things like that, it requires huge amounts of money and financing these things takes years, but you also can incur huge costs um, just for financing those things. But when you have a huge cash position, that lowers a lot of the risk and therefore lowers the expense associated with those loans. So BEP has been one of my favorite stocks and I'm continuing to look into them. I know there's been some talks lately with a few of the BEP funds potentially um, being bought in out or being taken over by other parts of the funds or things like that. Um, if you wanna learn more about that, we can talk about that in another video. Leave me a note in the comments. Um, I have not done a full-fledged video on BEP yet. If you would like me to, let me know. Thank you guys very much for your time. I'm looking forward to hearing what your favorite three stocks are for the month of February. Love you guys and have a great one.